that come to bear. And it's also true that there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs about how to orient yourself in a crisis so that as you're going through something, you know where to stand, you know how to face it, you know how to think about it. So God's word is not a contract. It's not a promise. Proverbs is not a promise. Proverbs is a proverb. These things tend to be true over time. So this is a wise way to live. If something's not working, here's some other wisdom to help. Well, hello and welcome to the Calvary Assembly podcast. I am your host, Jonathan Sigman. I am here with two of our pastors from our church, Stephen Nichols, Pastor Bob Reeves. And uh, really the heart and the purpose of this podcast is to talk about and try to answer really challenging questions that arise in scripture and how we can apply them to our lives today. So our church is... uh, in the midst of a series of teachings right now on the book of Proverbs. And I think that uh, the book of Proverbs raises a a lot of really interesting tension points for us as followers of Jesus. And uh, so that's what I want to be able to talk about today. So the book of Proverbs has tons of wisdom Mm -hmm. within all of it. So I, I think of it saying things like, uh, Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. And we've all seen this right. many instances, many times in our lives. I mean, I so I think of this as an example, like say I get really mad and I come at a coworker, we'll just call him Stephen. Um, for you know, just we're really imagining. To, yeah, like it's just really this, this would never happen <laughs> here, but okay. It's, this, this fictitious person named Steven does something really dumb and out of line. I get really mad. I start yelling. He starts yelling back at me. I start yelling back. And, uh, you know, uh, all joking aside, we've been a part of, like, right. real conversations where it, it does. It keeps escalating. You get loud. The next person gets louder. That's how it goes. And so we see proverbs like this, and we see the value it has for our lives. Because if if I were to use a soft answer, or you were to use a soft answer, if I was coming at you, it really can turn away that wrath, and it can really change the course of that conversation and that relationship. So we see these Proverbs, and we're like, yes, that makes sense. That's really helpful for good human flourishing. But there are these other Proverbs that when you read them, you start to think, eh, I'm not so sure about that. So I want to get your take on some of those Proverbs. Uh, So uh, one that I think of is in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, or it's actually repeated a very similar in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. And they both say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So my question is, do people who do not fear the Lord, do they not have wisdom, I'd be interested in getting your take because this sounds like another one of these arrogant Christian beliefs right. that, you know, kind of puts Christians at this level and everybody else at this level. So Stephen, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, wh- what do you think? Do you think that on the fear of the Lord? Yeah. So of course, I don't believe that what the Bible is saying is that if, if you don't fear the God, that if you don't have a relationship with God, that you can't have any wisdom or knowledge. I, of course, don't think that that's true or accurate, that there are things to be gained over a lifetime of years and experience, uh, and even through our own human knowledge that God has even blessed us with, that we can we can have this wisdom, we can understand things. So this is not a question of, if you don't fear God, then you can't be smart, or you can't have any wisdom whatsoever. Uh, but I do think that there is a different, almost paradigm that we can see life through when we are in fear of the Lord, and when we are uh, in relationship with the God of the universe, that we can now see things through a different lens than if we had not been in that relationship with God. So uh, that's that's kind of my overall overall thoughts on that specific idea. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's lots of different kinds of wisdom. So I don't think Scripture is saying that the only wisdom that exists is the wisdom of God. In fact, James talks about there's there's gifts that come from above, So there's a godly wisdom. There's wisdom that just comes from humans having done things over time and learned how to do them well. And there's a kind of dark wisdom, too, how you can use certain forces, uh, intimidation, manipulation, coercion to get what you want. 
And so it's a kind of wisdom if the goal is to get what you want right. at the cost of everyone else. What's what I think the claim of Scripture is not that there's no other wisdom. It's that when we follow the wisdom of God, what we find is that everyone benefits, yeah. not just us. So I do feel like the, the other thing going on with this Bible verse of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and, and much of the problem of the book of Proverbs really centers around, okay, well, why should I live my life in accordance with a book that's 2,000 years old, that the Proverbs were written over the course of a really long time. But right. this ancient text, how is it going to tell me how to live? Like, why do I need to live my life in that way? Like, is it, you know, why, why am I submitting yeah. to this? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the funny thing about that question is you don't actually have to. <laughs> and uh, I think that's that's one of the beautiful and confusing things about God is that he does provide us the, the choice that we can either rely on his wisdom or we can rely on his, our own yeah, or somebody right. else's wisdom. And so that's, that's one thing, that God is never going to force us to do this. However, uh, there is something to be said that uh, that God has created this world, he's created our universe through his wisdom. And um, if we are to understand God better, if we are to understand ourselves better and our world and our family and our cultures better, uh, then I think God is making the claim that we need to be connected to the creator of all of those things. And it reminds me of even going way back to the very beginning of the Bible, uh, where Adam and Eve, they, they make the decision that they are not going to listen to the voice of God, and they're going to take the fruit from the tree from the knowledge of, of good and evil. And this essentially, it's, it's describing wisdom. It's not just them disobeying God, though it is. Um, it's them deciding that I am going to decide for myself uh, what is good and what is evil, what is good and what is bad, and I, I'm not going to rely on God. And when that happens, there's a separation between us and, and, and God, and now everything becomes cursed. Because when you separate yourself from the only source of good in the world, the only thing that can come from that is death and destruction. Uh, and they decided, I'm not going to rely on the wisdom of God, and I'm going to do my own thing, and now there's this separation between it. But but it is the way in which God created all of the universe, so he's He's inviting us to rely on his wisdom, uh, because it is the way that the world operates in the way that he created it, but he won't force us to do so. Uh, but if we decide to go against his wisdom, then we shouldn't be surprised that when we separate ourselves from the source of good, then it's probably going to bring destruction and pain and evil inside of our lives. Now, the only other thing I'm thinking, though, is over the course of the last several thousand years, we have learned a lot. We have progressed a lot in a lot of ways, and in a lot of ways, maybe regressed. I don't, I don't know, depending on how you think about that. But, but what do you do with that tension, Pastor Bob, that, that we have had all this progression, but it's like the, the fear of the Lord, like it's, it's centered in the knowledge, you know, like that, that verse, that tension. How do, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I don't think that the best wisdom is always the newest thing out. I think we do have to divorce ourselves from the idea that uh, just because our technology is good, that all of our other areas of wisdom are good, so we can go down the road at 70 miles an hour. That's <laughs> way better than riding a horse, so I'm told. But, but that doesn't mean that all of our other forms of wisdom in terms of relationship, decision-making, discernment, who to marry, all that stuff, that we've gotten any better at that. In fact, you could make the argument that we've gotten uh, not so good at that. So Proverbs is kind of a, a generational distilled wisdom. And, and when you look at that, we've gained wisdom over time. These are the things that we've proven generationally that works. I think that's a really cool concept. And then what do you want? Do you want instant food? Do you want gourmet food? You know, you can use the same ingredients, but that when the ingredients have time to marry, when they have time to, to uh, work together, it produces something quite remarkable, and usually the distinction is time. Yeah. And so there's yeah. a reason why Proverbs is still here. Mm -hmm. uh, it has stood the test of time. There's a lot of wisdom in just realizing there's wisdom there. I also think that, that we should not confuse education with wisdom, uh, that there's we can learn things, we have insights, and we have, and our technology has improved significantly from that, and we're all better for it in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's not the same thing as wisdom. And in fact, I would say that there is a lot of evidence to say that sometimes we have not grown in some ways if we don't allow it, that some, sometimes we're still repeating the same mistakes over and over again in our culture that cultures did hundreds and thousands of years ago, uh, that there's a difference between 
wisdom and education or knowledge. And I think that's what God is calling us into. It's not, he's, I don't think he's saying that you can't have an understanding about something mm-hmm. unless you have a relationship with me. But there is a there is a, a, a paradigm in which we can see our life through and in which we can operate in his world when we have his wisdom. And there's something to be missed when we're not engaging in that relationship with God. Um, so I think that's a very important distinction in this conversation. Yeah, that's Agreed. Good. So how do we gain God's wisdom in our hearts and in our lives. What, what, how do we do that? Stephen, I'll go to you. Yeah. So, uh, the wonderful thing I think about God's wisdom is that, um, at least for me, I have this perception that wisdom is something that is difficult to gain. And to be sure, there is something, there is sometimes life experience that you have to go through in order to gain wisdom, um, but it's not unobtainable. Uh, that God actually tells us that his wisdom calls out and cries out to us. In fact, throughout the entire Proverbs, uh, wisdom is kind of personified as this woman called Lady Wisdom. And in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, it says that she stands on the street corner. Wisdom is standing on the street corner, calling to us, right. saying, anyone who has ears to hear, very similar to what Jesus says, anyone who has ears to hear, uh, you know, listen up, because wisdom is calling to us, and, and wisdom wants to be found, if you will. Uh, and and so God is calling out to us. Yeah. His word, his voice is calling to us. And if you are if you are seeking it, if you have the openness to search out God's wisdom, God promises that that, that he's faithful to give us that wisdom. And uh, so I think it, it takes a journey of seeking out the wisdom of the Lord. And we're going to talk more like, okay, how do you do that a little bit later? But God's wisdom calls to us, and we have the opportunity to hold on to it. Yeah, I, I think the challenge is God's wisdom is not the only one calling to us. Like yeah. our world is not absent of voices. So which are the voices that we're going to listen to? And I think one of the uh, helpful things about Proverbs is it kind of trains us to hear the voice and understand it. In the first nine chapters of Proverbs, there are four characters basically that give speeches. And one is a father to a son. Mm-hmm. One is the personification of wisdom, which is a woman uh, of wisdom. Uh, one is a wicked man and one is a woman of folly. There's not an absence of voices in our world. The, the question is, how do we know which ones to listen to or yeah. give credence to? And I think that's where Proverbs helps us a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's not just for the sake of like becoming holier so that mm, right, we can right. just know more about God. But I think what the Proverbs tell us and what it's attempting to communicate to us is that if we live in the wisdom of God, that we legitimately can be a blessing to the people around us, that we can live an abundant life, and that the people around us can experience that abundant life, and we can be a a blessing to the nations, if you will. And uh, there's joy, there's fruit, there's life to be had when we're following God's wisdom. It's not just about gaining some kind of understanding or holier-than-thou checklist item, Mm -hmm. uh, but it can bring abundant life to us and everybody that we touch if we're living in the wisdom that God has called us into. Yeah, true. So another portion of the book of Proverbs is it really talks extensively about wisdom is found in fearing the Lord. And so I guess my question for you is, what does that word fear mean? Are are we supposed to kind of live in terror Hmm. of a judgmental God? And then like, that's what really wisdom looks like. Uh, What what does fear of the Lord mean uh, in relationship to wisdom in scripture? (laughs) Well, that's kind of how I was raised. (laughs) (laughs) I was was told Old Testament stories about uh, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, two uh, sons of a uh, priest. So since I was a PK, a preacher's kid, uh, this was supposed to reference me. <laughs> and uh, I was running around the church, and they told me that Hophni and Phineas was running around the church, and, and God struck them dead. Oh, no! Oh, <laughs> well, no. when I read in Scripture, they were doing a lot more than running around the church. In fact, running around is a is an expression that's used for what they were doing, but not what I that's was That's awful. Yeah. They said that to oh, you? Sure. Oh, sure. Wait, man. wait. I, the, maybe it was a prophetic word, because I was running in the basement of my church in fourth grade, tripped and fell over somebody's foot and shattered a glass trophy case with my face. Oh, no. So maybe... It was God. It was the Lord. I, it's hard to know. Yeah, that seems like good theology. <laughs> yeah, not so much. No, um, so you can't get away from the word fear, though I think its yeah. definition um, and how the original language means it is different than the way we tend to think about it. Hmm. And so I hear a lot of uh, translations using the word like uh, being in awe of God. Um, and, and I think there's something to that. There's an there's a explanation I like to give uh, about this. 
So at some point we were all kids and we wanted to be out later than our parents told us that we could be out. So we had a curfew and, and now we're right up against that curfew and our friends are telling us to stay and we know our parents want us to be home. And in that moment, we're going to make a decision and we're going to make a decision on who we're most worried about disappointing. Hmm. And it is a kind of fear, right? I don't want to disappoint that person. So it's kind of like that. If, if we are concerned about disappointing God, it's amazing how well we will live. Yeah. Like the, kind, the way we'll treat other people. But if we're more worried about disappointing someone who's tempting us towards something or an opportunity that uh, is dubious at best, but you know, there might be an upside financially, we, we can take those options, but we wind up showing that what we're really afraid of is being poor or not having friends or not having a title or not having a degree. And those fears aren't worth pursuing. The fear of God, that's a very different thing. And we wind up in very different places. This past summer, me and my family were able to go down to uh, the Outer Banks, and it's right on the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we, me and my brothers are a big fan of like bodyboarding when we're down there. It's a ton of fun. If you haven't done that, it's so much fun. It is. The problem with it is that the waves sometimes can become unpredictable, and uh, if you're not careful, it will it will take you and it will drag you down and you know rip you across on the bottom of the you know on the sand and everything, and it can be a very terrifying thing. And so sometimes you go and you look at the ocean. You're standing in the water and you're just you're looking at this and the ocean is not a bad thing in fact it can be a very good thing it is a good thing it can provide life and uh, joy and, and pleasure to to many people uh, but if you're reckless around the ocean it can be devastating and it can be even dangerous so I think that we're supposed to have this healthy amount of fear uh, uh, when we're in the water to know that if I'm not careful if I'm reckless or I'm not if I'm careless around this that it could wreck me. And it's not because the ocean is bad. It's because I am entering into something that's very powerful and uh, I did not take the appropriate steps to be careful around that. And I think there's something similar with God, that God's not bad. He's not looking for us to be terrified of him. But if we're reckless, if, if we're careless, uh, that he that we're supposed to stand in a healthy amount of fear and, and awe and trembling and wondering before him, say, oh my goodness, this is just a being greater than, my con can, than I can control. It's somebody far more powerful than I can even comprehend. And we're supposed to go of that with a respect and a trembling and, and a fear. Uh, not that we're terrified, but that we're, we have this immense respect for the nature and the person yeah. of God. That's good. Yeah. That is, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm going to invite you guys, if you want, you're welcome to, kid, to eat donuts again. <laughs> Last time, Pastor Bob had his first one in 15 years. We this would be my second. Yeah, we had our first one in 15 well, minutes. I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I told you, Jonathan, before this that I'm I'm eyeing that peanut oh, butter yeah, one right now. Grab that peanut butter. Don't you butter dare right take my peanut butter one. I don't want to have you is slapping great. me on camera in front of the church. Oh, so. wow. That, that's great. <laughs> I will say this, that this thing, I, you're going to have to take my word for it. This is about four and a half pounds of peanut butter filling. But it's healthy. It's peanut butter. It's uh, protein, protein for your day. That's how you build this jacked I body. It. I believe it. I believe it. Okay. So I'm going to eat this. I don't know how I'll eat this, but we'll make do. All right. So Proverbs is full of these statements that say, uh, seemingly almost like, if you do this, then it's going to result in blessing, something really good for you. So uh, a real common one that, that you hear is train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not turn from it. But uh, I have met and seen incredibly strong Christian parents who have done, done it the right way, not perfect, but been incredible parents, and their kids don't follow God when they're older. Hmm. And... So this like raises these in, these really big tension points for us, or or I even think of uh, there, there's a lot of proverbs around how to handle money and wealth and these kind of things, and so it says uh, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And yet what I have seen is that some of the hardest working people I know yeah. still are struggling financially. And this is not just like a, oh, well, I guess you just like view scripture differently. Y you play this out in your life and you're like, maybe the Bible is not correct. And then maybe I'm not going to be a believer or a follower because of it. 
you know, or maybe the Bible is correct, but I'm somehow living in the wrong yeah. and I need to like find out because maybe God's mad at me because I have been working hard or I did try as hard as I could to be a great parent. And the thing I want most in my life is for my kids to follow after Jesus, but now they don't. Yeah. And I like, I, I know I can't control that, but like this scripture says, if I do this, then this will happen. So yeah. I guess, Pastor, I'd, I'd look to you first to get mm. your take on what to do about this. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so is God a good father? And how many of his kids go down paths they shouldn't go? Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, So we need to be careful about how we define those terms. Like even in, in the, uh, the issue of, you know, if, if you're diligent, then, then you're going to do well financially. Um, I think even there, what we find is that our culture has a definition of wealth that it's, it's pretty high. Uh, most of us, when we are struggling, are still doing better than most of the world. And so by a biblical standard, our, is that pretty good? It is. It's very good. <laughs> what, kind, what kind of you got there? What do you got? I, I went with the, uh, the old classic, you know. What is that, cinnamon roll? <laughs> cinnamon sure. roll. Yeah. Uh, that is good. I don't know, but I'm like dripping all over myself. <laughs> <laughs> no shame as Pastor Bob's dropping these incredible gifts of wisdom on us. Yeah, I couldn't do both at the same time. <laughs> so I think the idea is if I'm diligent in my work, then, then I will have wealth, right? I'll always right. have more than enough. And how we define wealth in our culture is not how most of the world defines it. So how are we going to think about that? And then secondly, there are situational crises that come into our life. Uh, we can have a health issue. We can have uh, an economic downturn in the country that uh, causes the elimination of some jobs. There, there can be all kinds of things that come to bear. And it's also true that there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs about how to orient yourself in a crisis so that as you're going through something, you know where to stand, you know how to face it, you know how right. to think about it. So God's word is not a contract. It, it, it's not a promise. Proverbs is not a promise. Hmm. Proverbs is a proverb. These things tend to be true over time. Right. So this is a wise way to live. If something's not working, here's some other wisdom to help. And I think that's, I even think for myself when I'm reading through the Proverbs that I will often th look at them like it's a promise that if I do this thing, then I will gain this thing. And, uh, and you put your finger on it earlier that when it doesn't happen, I feel like there's something wrong with me. Mm. Uh, I feel like God doesn't love me as much. I was a youth pastor for, you know, six years and dealt, talked with a lot of parents whose kids walked away from the faith. And, um, I mean, that's that's a real deep hurt that somebody that you that you care about, that you raised, and now you feel like you have a responsibility for them, uh, and it's almost your fault that that they're no longer walking with Jesus mm. anymore. Yeah. And, and, and the Bible says that if I do this, then then they'll stay in the faith and that they will, uh, you know, walk in the way that they should go. And uh, so I think that that distinction is helpful. That this is not this is not a promise. That this is a wisdom, a proverb that that we can right. cling to as a general general rule. But yeah, yeah, amen. So. For all of us, whether you're wherever you're watching and tuning in, how can we make it that we can apply this wisdom to our lives? Like how how do the proverbs actually change our lives over time? So I think that we we talked about this a little bit, uh, but there's this idea again that, that keeps getting repeated over and over in Proverbs, and it is the fear of the Lord. Uh, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it talks about, I don't know how many times, a lot. And I think it's intentionally making the point uh, that, that the fear of the Lord is going to be the start of this journey of wisdom. And I think that that is meant to be taken place in the context of a relationship. That if you fear the Lord, that you are engaging with him in a relationship with God, that you are coming before the Lord and seeking that wisdom. And again, that he promises that if you seek, he is faithful uh, to uh, give you that wisdom, that if you're searching for that wisdom, it calls out to you. Uh, so I think that looks like an engagement in a relationship with your heavenly father. I think it looks like engaging with the uh, with the Proverbs and, and reading through them and coming back to them time and time again and, and diligently searching in prayer that, Lord, I, I need your help. I, I cannot rely on my own wisdom or strength or understanding because I don't, I don't got it right now. 
and I need your help in this area. I, I need your wisdom to give me the strength to be able to do whatever it is that's at hand. And it's this constant going back and forth with God that, uh, that builds that relationship, that builds our fear and trembling before him, and allows him to pour his spirit of wisdom inside of us so that we can make different decisions inside of our life. Yeah. I've, I've noticed with Scripture and, and Proverbs in particular, uh, as I have gone through different seasons of life and have different experiences in life, it seems to unlock different uh, applications to that wisdom. So when I was an adolescent, uh, you know, let's say my life experience was limited, and so there's a way Scripture appeared to me. Uh, you enter into college, you enter into marriage, you enter into parenthood, you enter into work responsibilities. And these things kind of open your mind to nuances in life that you hadn't anticipated. And the good news is, is that the wisdom of Scripture actually seeps into and expands into those spaces, and it has something to say. That, that just because you read it five years ago doesn't mean you have it nailed down now. That's, that's really something to think about. And even, like, you, you watch uh, people today who are uh, fans of video games, right? They don't just play the game one time. They play the game over and over and over again. Why? They're, they're wanting to increase their capacity, their ability. Uh, and we can keep going back to Scripture over and over yeah. and over again. That it actually does sharpen us. It actually does breathe life into us. It actually orients us in the way that we should go. So just that replayability winds up being a very key feature in how yep. we approach Scripture. I also think that that Scripture has such a depth of wisdom uh, inside of it that really wherever you are walking through in your life, that there is wisdom that can be applied to whatever that is. Yep. And even going back to the, the first question that you asked about, you know, promises versus Proverbs, that I, the Bible, it, it's not naive to the fact uh, that that these are not promises. It's not like it's 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 unaware that if you do these things, that these this is always going to happen. Uh, in fact, that Proverbs is part of a collection of books called Wisdom Literature, and there's three books in the Bible of Wisdom Literature: Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. And Job and Proverbs is like the wisdom that we can that we can follow in the part of God's creative order. But Ecclesiastes and Job uh, talks about, especially Job, what happens when you do do the right thing. And you don't get the best results. <laughs> right. And and Job is all about that. He he didn't do anything wrong, and he did the right thing. He mm. followed the proverb, the wisdom of God, and he got a negative result. Mm. And so the Bible's not naive about that. That there's there's instances in Scripture where now we can engage with the person of Job. We can engage with Ecclesiastes or other parts of the Psalms and things like that. Where when life is not going wrong or, or not going well for us. Uh, that now there is other kinds of wisdom that we can access to get us through those those times as well. And, and, and Scripture is not, Scripture knows that we are in a broken world still, that just because you've mm -hmm. done the right thing, said the right thing in the right order, it doesn't mean we're going to get our guaranteed results because we're in this broken world. Uh, so I think just in, in um, engulfing ourselves, surrounding ourselves with the story of God's Word over and over again, will allow us to be in that relationship where we can use and utilize that wisdom for our own purposes in our life. I, I like that idea a lot. I like that I, that concept of the wisdom literature having a unique space. Because yeah. in the Old Testament, you have prophets, right? And and they're all about vision and, and passionate proclamation. And you have the commands, which are all about this is the way you should uh, walk and, and, uh, and live. And all of those things are very, very clear. You can follow the rules very well and still blow up your life yeah. through pride and through arrogance. You can have mm -hmm. a lot of passion in life and still do a lot of damage to other people. What is going to help us to follow the, the laws of God and live the passion of God without becoming something we don't want to be or, or doing damage to other people? And the answer is the wisdom of God. Yeah. And the it's wisdom really literature really provides this option for us. It's really yeah. good. Well, I guess what I would close with is that the book of Proverbs really is a gift yeah. of yeah. wisdom for us that, that we have access to. We're not just left all alone to try to figure this out on our own. God has given us this as a gift for how to live well, live righteous, and uh, it doesn't mean that everything's going to go perfect in our lives or uh, that everything is a formula. It's, it's not 
a, a promise, but it is it is really helpful for us and uh, just just great wisdom. And so, uh, as an action step for you, if you're tuning in and watching, just want to say thank you for doing so. Uh, but I, I just would even encourage you to to read a proverb a day. Uh, it can be a great way. It'll take you 31 days, a month long, to be able to get through it and and take little notes. Uh, it can be on the side of your Bible or off to the you know off in a journal of what stands out to you. And each and every day, there's something new and something fresh. You'll see a lot of things repeating. And I would even say, even if you've done this in the past and you've read it before, it's going to be fresh again. Yeah. And it can hit you in a different way in a different season. So would encourage you to uh, crack open your Proverbs, get that wisdom. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you guys next time. All right. So what do you think, cinnamon or chocolate? <laughs> Let's uh, let's let's uh, have you go for the cinnamon. Mm, you chose wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was a test. That was a test, and I failed once again. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Perfect. Okay. He said you chose wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the best was like PB's in the middle of talking. I'm like drooling glaze down no, my face. Ignored, he's yeah. like he's like trying not to laugh as he's talking. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs>